Christmas Day 2021, a massive rocket was launched from French Guiana, carrying not only the largest space telescope ever built, but also the hopes and dreams of thousands of scientists and engineers from 14 countries who made this moment happen. Two months and a million miles later, the James Webb Telescope arrived at its destination. As its protective sun shields unfurled, as its golden mirrors locked into place, decades of those dreams were realized and exceeded. The James Webb Telescope has already produced images of the universe that are unprecedented in their clarity. These are gas clouds incubating young stars as seen through the Hubble Telescope, and here as seen through the Webb Telescope. This is a gas cloud surrounding a dying star as seen by Hubble, and here as seen by Webb. Closer to home, this is Neptune as seen by Hubble and here by Webb, revealing gossamer rings barely glimpsed in the past. The Webb Telescope has also captured the turbulence accompanying the birth of a star, the spiral arms of a phantom galaxy, the stunning dust rings formed by orbiting binary stars, as well as new images of our universe in its infancy, including what may well be the first stars created after the Big Bang. The data is already challenging our understanding of how early galaxies formed and holds the promise of insights into the nature of black holes, dark matter, and dark energy. So today we are thrilled to discuss these results with the very people who are peering through the lens of humankind's most powerful tool for revealing for us all a startling new view of the cosmos. Good afternoon. So good to see all of you. I'm Brian Green, and as many of you may know, I come from the world of theoretical physics, where we use mathematics, we use equations to try to push the frontiers, the boundary of understanding. But of course, that mathematics, it, it doesn't have any role in articulating and understanding the universe until that math makes contact with experiment, with, with observations. And of course, leading the way in the realm of observations is indeed the device, the James Webb Space Telescope that you just saw a brief summary of. And so it is wonderful to have a discussion of the cutting edge results that are now coming from the telescope. We're gonna organize the discussion in three parts, sort of like a three course meal. In the, in the first part, we're going to focus on the insights into the early universe, the formation of early galaxies, cosmology, things of that sort. We'll then switch over to a, a second group of guests who will focus more on the local neighborhood, what James Webb is revealing regarding the solar system, planets, asteroid, comets. And finally, in the third part, we will switch over to a focus on what we are learning about planets beyond our solar system, so-called exoplanets. And I think the collective result of these conversations will really give you a sense of the true wonder of discovery that the James Webb Telescope is already spearheading and amazing things that are going to be in store. Okay, so let's get going. Joining us here in Brisbane is Carl Glazebrook, who is Distinguished Professor of Astronomy at the Center of Astrophysics and Supercomputing at Swinburne University of Technology in Melbourne. He is the current co-director of the James Webb Australian Data Center. Carl, thanks so much for being here. And joining us from Washington, D.C., we have Nobel laureate John Mather, who is NASA's senior project scientist for the James Webb Space Telescope. He has spent most of the past three decades bringing the Webb Telescope to fruition. Welcome to you both.
So, John, let's, let's, let's begin with you. you. You and I, over the years, have had many conversations. One in particular, of course, stands out, which was in December of 2021. I believe it was December, just before the launch of the James Webb Telescope. And in that conversation with a number of other scientists, you were describing, you know, um, a certain degree of confidence, perhaps a little anxiety about what might transpire over the next year, year and a half. Here we are now a year and change later. What do you think? How, how has it done? It has worked beautifully. We are so thrilled with what it's doing and what it's showing us. And the ob observations are perfect, they're gorgeous, the pictures are beautiful in a way that we never could have imagined. And technically the observatory is twice as good as we thought it would be. The pictures are much sharper, they, we can see better than we ever hoped we could ever do. So combination of surprises in the beauty, uh, surprises in the technical performance, and even the predicted life of the observatory is now over 20 years. So it gives us time for people who are just being born to come up and uh, use the telescope. Now that, that is remarkable, and you actually, I don't know if you heard it, but you got at least one person applauding for the, um, <laughs> for, for the 20-year lifetime. Now when we, yes. So when we, when we first spoke about this, I gather it was more of a 10-year of a lifetime with the possibility of longer based on how much fuel was used to orient things once you got to the target location, the so-called Lagrange point. So I gather that must have gone incredibly well. Yes, it did. The, uh, the launch vehicle got us exactly where we wanted to go to use the least possible amount of extra fuels for adjusting the orbit. And we thank the Ariane Spas company because they did it beautifully. Yeah, so that, that, is, that is really wonderful. We're gonna talk about a, a number of topics, but I'm just wondering off the top of your head, is there one insight that has come from the telescope so far that really stands out for you? There really is. Uh, we were surprised, a lot of astronomers are very surprised that the galaxies seem to have grown hotter and faster and bigger than we ever imagined they would, and we don't know why. So that's the big observational surprise. You could say, well, how come were we wrong? Well, I can't tell you yet, uh, but we know uh, from pictures that we made with the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, we extrapolate to what we think would happen farther back in time than Hubble could see. And well, something's wrong about that. We don't know. So uh, one possibility is that uh, galaxies are dusty. Dust grains absorb starlight and turn it into infrared. So the Webb telescope can pick up the infrared that we might never have noticed before. So that's a possible explanation for the puzzle that we've been looking at. But at any rate, right now, we just have a puzzle which is not understood. So Carl, this actually leads right into your sweet spot, right? This is an area that you work on. So can you just elaborate some of them when John just met him? What, what is the puzzle and, and where do we stand in trying to figure it out? Yeah, so it's been a very exciting nine months. I've been waiting for Web for 30 years and we were expecting to discover the first galaxies because that was his mission. We weren't expecting to discover them in the first week. Uh, literally, these galaxies up here were found within one week of receiving the first data from Webb. And these are seen just a few hundred million years after the Big Bang, and they're very bright. And they had eluded Hubble because they're so high redshifted, they're beyond what Hubble could see, but they're still quite large and quite bright and very extraordinary objects. And, and so when you have a puzzle of this sort, obviously it requires confidence in a variety of measurements. You don't just want to see the picture of the galaxy. You've got to know when it formed. You want to say something about its mass. And, and how do you make those measurements and what degree of confidence do you have in them? So Webb can do two things. It can take images at different wavelengths and from the brightness of the light in different colors, you can deduce how far away the galaxy is and when you're seeing it. And it can also take what's called spectra, where the light is spread out and analyzed in great detail. And then you can exactly now, what's called the cosmic redshift, the epoch at which you're seeing the galaxy. 
And so maybe we can just spend a moment on that because I think it's pretty vital to everything that's going on. So, so John, just quickly, when we're talking about redshift, I think many people are familiar with the idea. It's sort of the stretching of light. I think we have a little graphic on it. Can you just take us through what that is and why it's important to understanding these observations? Yes, yeah, so the general idea that we have was discovered uh, almost a century ago. The universe is expanding, which means that distant objects are going away from us at enormous speeds, roughly proportional to the distance. So if you divide the distance by the speed of motion, you get the apparent age of the universe. So that was 1929 we found that out. And what this picture is showing you is that when an object is going away from us, we receive the waves less frequently than we would have if it were just sitting still. So that stretches out the wavelengths. And uh, we now use this as a measure of how rapidly the object is going away from us. So that's the reason that we have to build an infrared telescope to see those first galaxies. Now, Carl, one, one question obviously that comes to mind for anyone who's been following the news, you noted how quickly those galaxies were found, and pretty quickly it was also announced the redshift, namely, you know, how far away and how early in the evolution of the universe we believe that they formed, that number was updated also pretty quickly too. And so why did that happen? Why was there a change in our understanding that happened so rapidly? Yeah, so, so the very first objects had, very, a few discovered had very high redshift. Um, that was inferred from the distribution of light in different wavelengths. But then the Webb telescope had to be recalibrated when it was in, in space, and those calibrations changed, and they changed the balance of the light, and that changed some of the redshift answers and brought a few of them down. And so right now, are we confident that the redshifts that are being reported are stable? We're not going to likely update those in a month or six months? There's a range. Some of them were really confident. Uh, some of them were not so confident. And for some, we actually now have spectra where we can just do this dispersing the light and measure the redshift exactly. It is about three or four now. We've confirmed spectra at this redshift 12 uh, epoch, which is about a few hundred million years after the Big Bang. So we're now sure about those ones. And we're going to get very many more in the next few months. And so the puzzle then is that these galaxies formed really early and they're really massive and really bright. And our standard understanding of galaxy formation would not suggest that something that big, that bright could form that quickly. Is that the issue? Yes. So there's two things. There's firstly the galaxy formation models, which predicted that galaxies would be smaller and fainter and rarer. And then we had an empirical extrapolation from Hubble into its earlier time, which again suggested we wouldn't find that many. So both of those seem to be wrong. And so is that something that people are upset about or excited by? I personally am I'm delighted. It makes it more interesting. Um, and make clear us into the interesting physics happening early in the universe. And do you have any idea what that might be? Yes, so somehow you have to form these galaxies very quickly and build up mass. So galax galaxy formation uh, is dominated by the role what's called cold dark matter. Galaxies can't form without cold dark matter. So if I'm allowed to speculate outrageously, I think that James Webb may give us clues into the nature of cold dark matter in the early universe. So you're saying the cold dark matter is what forms the gravitational center. Yes. That pulls in the surrounding yes. material that ultimately yes. does become the galaxy, but nobody knows what the dark matter is and perhaps some quality, unexpected quality yeah. of it might, might yeah. explain things. So that's a, that's a outrageous speculation of mine, but I have a hunch. And, and, and so if that's the case, is that a major rewrite Yes. You think so? Yes. We will see. I could, we'll be wrong. Right. And, and, um, and I'm just wondering, behind that conjecture, is there deeper understanding that you don't want to share yet for it being too soon to let out? Because we're very friendly here. and um... <laughs> We see a lot of puzzles in the early universe. So this slide we're seeing now shows some quenched galaxies we found with Hubble. Uh, they, they live, they're living about a billion years after the Big Bang. But these galaxies are really massive. They're about five times more massive than the Milky Way is today. Mm. Remember, the Milky Way has been forming for 12 billion years. Yeah. Uh, so this is like a cosmic snapshot of a billion years after the Big Bang. These galaxies are super massive and super old. 
and the one in the bottom right we found from a spectrum with Webb that's like a billion years old already. So that points to something really crazy happening in the early universe in terms of early star formation, early galaxy formation. And so, John, when you, when you hear about this, I mean, I, I've noticed in previous conversations with you that um, you always take the burden of wondering if somehow the observations are wrong. And, and I think that's a laudable place to be because if you're talking about major rewrites of understanding, you want to make sure that the, the data that you're basing it on is accurate. Where do you stand in this? Could it be that six months from now, the observations we realize aren't as accurate as we thought? Or what, what do you think? I think the observations will turn out to be accurate, but the interpretation is tricky. You see what we showed you there on the picture are little fuzzy dots and they barely is possible to see that they have a shape and a size and a color. And so we have to make up our entire interpretation based on a few little fuzzy dots with a spectrum and a color. And so that's a big, big jump. And we do it with calculation and imagination. And we could miss something. We could, we could fail to imagine what's really going on out there. And that's where our interesting physics is going to come from as we try to make our imagination match the reality. Uh, final question on this work in progress. In order to really understand galaxy formation, obviously there's fundamental physics involved, as, as Carl, you described. But ultimately, you got to put this stuff into a powerful computer and crank it through the code because it's too complex for us. Maybe chat GPT can do it, but we can't do it, you know, you know in, our, in our own minds. And so when you get to that level of simulation, aren't there a lot of wheels and bells and things that you can tweak that might take your galaxy formation simulation and allow it to match the data? There is and there isn't. So galaxy formation is, as you say, a complicated process. You have gas condensing, stars forming, but there are some fundamental constraints. So we can simulate the behavior of dark matter quite precisely. So given the properties of dark matter, we can say how big these dark matter halos or globules of dark matter are early times, and we know the sort of what we call the baryon density of the universe, the number of atoms per cubic megaparsec. So we have some basic information about how many atoms there are to form galaxies. Um, so we're getting sort of close to sort of violating some of those basic constraints in terms of how rapidly you have to convert uh, gas into, into galaxies. Yeah. Um, all right, so we'll see where that goes, but it's certainly an exciting prospect that when we understand it, uh, the things may turn out differently from what we thought. Another relevant topic, uh, John, that has certainly been um, an interesting motivation for certain class of observations is called the Hubble tension, a discrepancy between the expansion rate of the universe as determined by two distinct approaches. Can you, just in a, in a brief moment, explain what that tension refers to? Yes, uh, well, one model that's uh, been used very well is to take the hot and cold spots, what we call anisotropy, in the maps of the cosmic microwave background radiation, and get the statistics. And there are uh, so many little wiggles and bumps in these curves that you can adjust a model of the universe to match it very precisely. And we do that, and we think we know what the answer is, and it, we get one number. And then the, we should be able to match that to direct measurements of the expansion rate of galaxies running away from us. And uh, we get a different answer. And it's highly st statistically significant. That is to say five sigma or so, which the, means there's a almost very low chance that this happened by some random process. So something real is happening, but we can't tell yet if it's a mistake in our observations, a mistake in our interpretation, or just something nature is surprising us with, such as a new kind of dark matter, a new kind of dark energy, or something else that would be really exciting to, to discover. So if there's a Nobel Prize in here, that could be one of them. As spoken by a Nobel Prize winner. Yes, absolutely. Good advice. Uh, so, 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 uh, so, so just briefly, uh, dark matter and dark energy, I think we're all familiar. There are ingredients in the universe that we have some confidence are there. They don't give off light, but they do affect the expansion rate of the universe. And therefore, if we find something funny with the expansion rate, we might be finding something funny about dark matter and dark energy. Now, Carl, famously, there have been arguments about the expansion rate of the universe going all the way back to Hubble himself, right? I mean, and, and so... 
perhaps if someone heard about this Hubble tension, they would say, eh, you know, it's just one of those things that you know, ultimately will, will be worked out. But this one feels different because we're not comparing two approaches that are effectively the same, but done by two different groups to get the expansion rate of the universe. Now we're getting the expansion rate from early universe observations, the cosmic microwave background radiation that John mentioned, and observations of the later universe and trying to interpolate between them, but the interpolation is not working. So where do you come down on that? Is this a big deal? It's an extremely big deal. It's the biggest problem in cosmology. So, you, so you're right, what, what it is, is a mismatch between the expansion rate at early times and the expansion rate today. And today, with the expansion is dominated by dark energy, early times is dark matter. We have a model to connect those, but the model doesn't quite match up. And when we measure it today, we have a, a dozen different ways we can measure that, and they all converge to a given answer, which is significantly disrepant to what we infer from the early universe. So where James Webb can help is actually connecting those dots. There are techniques that James Webb can apply. We can measure the expansion rate at intermediate times, and that may help us solve this problem. And do you have a sense? I mean, John mentioned possibly a new understanding of dark matter, dark energy. Would you go in that direction too? Yeah, I would. Okay, so we just have to wait and see where that, that one goes. Third topic is something, you describe this as the most uh, important puzzle in cosmology. Other people have described the holy grail of observational cosmology to see what's known as population three galaxies or stars, which would be the, the first stars ever formed after the Big Bang. And correct me if I'm wrong, but just to give a relative sense, we believe that our sun is a third generation star, sort of a grandchild of the earliest stars. Have we seen the first stars or evidence thereof? There's been some claims, but the claims have yet to be confirmed by more detailed observations. So let me tell you what, the, what we're looking for. So stars make heavy elements. So for example, carbon, oxygen, the stuff that makes up our bodies. So in the early universe, there was none of those elements. There was just hydrogen and helium and a bit of lithium. And so stars formed in the early universe in what's called a pristine environment, and that changes their properties. It makes them more massive. For example, you have more massive stars. So the signature of this population three is uh, no heavy elements, extremely massive and hot stars. So those are the two key things to look for. Yeah. And that just the light you're seeing is coming from stars and not from something like black holes. And so there are observations to suggest that of at least one galaxy, but it's not yet clear whether those observations could be explained by population three or by some kind of unusual black hole. Aha. Uh -huh. So that, again, is an open question, but do you anticipate that we will, with the James Webb, be able to finally, conclusively... Yeah. I think we can, we can go back and we observe many things in more detail where we find these signatures, and we can look at higher resolution, get longer exposures. I think we'll resolve this in the first few years. First few years of observation, fantastic. Well, you know, because we're on a sort of speed dating approach to talking about the James Webb today, our time for this first section is almost out. But I do want to finish up with one final question to both of you. Start with you, Carl. In, in your wildest dreams, five years from now, what will we know that we don't know today from the James Webb? How the first galaxies formed? What's driving the physics of that rapid early formation? Is it some modification to like the sort of the wheels of galaxy formation or is it something more fundamental like dark, dark matter or dark energy? And John, for you, I, since you've started us off with this enticing 20 year time span, perhaps I'll push you 20 years from now as the web is reaching its final year of operation. What do you think the most stunning thing that you hope that we will achieve with the observation time? Well, there are two things where I think we could get a big surprise. One is the early universe we've been talking about and the, the origin of the giant black holes. You know, almost every galaxy has a giant black hole in the center. And we haven't really talked much about how that happens, uh, but I think we could get a big surprise in that area. And of course, the other area where in 20 years we could really learn something is something about the exoplanets. It's one of the other very, very difficult puzzles that we're working on and we're working very hard on them. So something just could turn up.
And indeed, we will be talking about exoplanets in part three of Speed Dating. So with that, please join me in thanking our guest for part one. Carl, thank, thank, you, thank you so much. John, thank you. All right, so in, in part two, we are going to move on to what the James Webb is telling us about the physics and astronomy in the more local environment, planets, asteroids, comets in our solar system. And to do that, I am going to be joined by a couple of wonderful guests. First here in Brisbane is Michelle Bannister, who is a New Zealand planetary astronomer and science communicator at the University of Canterbury, who among other research, will be using the Webb telescope to gain insight into how planets formed in our solar system. Welcome, Michelle. Thank you. And joining us from Washington, D.C. is Stephanie Milam, who is Deputy Project Scientist for the James Webb Space Telescope at NASA. Stephanie studies comets and asteroids to understand what role they may play in the evolution of planetary systems like our own. Welcome, Stephanie. Thanks so much for having me. So again, thank you both for being here. Michelle, let's begin. So you study what I gather are called Neptunian-like objects, which are small, icy objects that are far out in the solar system. Can you tell us why do you study them and how does the web particularly help you in that endeavor? So these are the little building blocks from the beginning of our planetary system. We think they form around other stars as well. Um, the ones out beyond Neptune, the ones trans-Neptunian objects, these are the ones that are a little more icy in, comp in composition. Um, so they're out beyond where water ice could still stay solid. And so they're dusty, they're icy, they're cousins of comets, but they can tell us about what that disk was like when it formed, and their little icy hearts hold the secrets of how that evolution has come through to the present day. It warms one's heart to hear about those icy <laughs> hearts. Um, so um, About 80, you know, 60 to 80 Kelvin above absolute zero. It's nice. Pretty warm by some standards. Um, but uh, are there particular members of that class of astronomical bodies that you've identified that you want to study? Or you just sort of look out and see what's interesting? So I have the pleasure of being part of a um, team of collaborators um, around the world and um, led to, um, by a colleague in the US um, who are looking at about um, just over 60 of these small worlds um, to see what the variation of surfaces is like. So... What are we going to see in terms of composition? And more than 80% of those targets have now been observed by JWST. So and, uh, we're, uh, we're looking forward to being able to release those results soon. And is JWST particularly set up to do this? I mean, what are the wavelengths that you are looking in? And I presume they overlap strongly with what the James Webb is sensitive to. Yeah, it's one of those things where... If you look in the wavelengths of light you see with your eyes, these objects look quite red surfaces. So they're... They don't have the fingerprints of that composition as easily able to discern. But uh, when you start getting into the wavelengths that uh, um, JWST can see in, you'll start to see those fingerprints of composition. And a lot of these molecules, they're things like you might get in your kitchen cleaning cupboard, right? It's uh, um, these kind of ammonia compounds or methane or um, things that, you know, are uh, uh, elements in our atmosphere here that we breathe, like uh, um, carbon monoxide that we exhale, or th things like carbon dioxide. Um, and is that water. surprising that you s see those particular molecules? We think that it's cold enough in the outer solar system they can be stable. So how much of them there are, which one worlds they're on, where they're present, this is what Webb is going to help us unlock. Amazing. So, so Stephanie, you know, there's a, a beautiful image, maybe we have it here, and I think we had it in the original piece of Neptune as viewed by Hubble and then as viewed by the James Webb Space Telescope, where all of a sudden you see these, these rings. Now, when I was a kid, it was, only, it was only Saturn that had rings. So, like, what was your reaction when you, when you saw this image? Uh, I was absolutely amazed. I think everyone in the world was amazed by this image. Um, it's absolutely one of my favorites so far. Um, what is absolutely fascinating about the capability of the James Webb Space Telescope for objects in our own solar system or even those beyond is 
we are a ring detection machine. Um, a lot of rings around the planets or small bodies even in our solar system are made of dust and ice. And the wavelengths that James Webb actually operates at is very tuned in to seeing these rings, as you can see in this image. Some of these rings in this Neptune image, um, we haven't seen for 30 years, not since the Voyager flyby. So it's absolutely fantastic that just in a mere blink of an eye, this telescope has the capability to detect things that we haven't seen um, without a spacecraft being nearby for, for decades. And so the rings that we see here, the rings that we're more familiar with, Saturn and so forth, are they more or less the same? Or are there distinct signatures that you learn something specific about what you're looking at? Um, so that's a fantastic question. Uh, some of the rings are the same and some of them are very different. Um, we're getting insight and clues into this almost every single day now with, with the James Webb Space Telescope, but also with other observatories that we've used in the past. Um, some of the rings we can actually see at optical or visible wavelengths. So you can see a lot of the rings of Saturn, as you said. Um, we could even see with you know the stretch of an eye, rings of Jupiter, um, but those are the rings that tend to be a lot more icy, a lot more reflective. Um, so the ones that are more dusty are the ones that JWST is revealing to us that we can't see um, with other observatories. Um, so even in this image of Jupiter, you can already start seeing those rings starting to appear. Um, and this was a fantastic capability and demonstration for this observatory. You know, the James Webb Space Telescope's designed to detect the farthest galaxies in our universe um, and, you know, planets that are, are really, really, really beyond our solar system. And to have a dynamic range and a capability to look at something as, a, as bright as Jupiter and its rings in the same image is a factor of 10,000. And we are able to capture all the fantastic glory of Jupiter and its entire system, the rings, small planet or small moons, um, as well as all the storms, the aurora, et cetera. And so do we know why rings form? I mean, are they a vital part of planetary formation or do they just happen in certain specific circumstances? So rings are remnant of when the actual planet itself formed. Um, we Sometimes that dust is actually the material that made that planetary body. Um, sometimes it's as the, the body is um, starting to form and it has its own angular momentum, some of the moons themselves will, will be colliding and destroy themselves and leave that dusty debris trail around. Um, and some of the rings are actually formed by processes within the moons themselves, um, for example, Europa is an ocean world. Um, we believe that there's um, interior ocean material that's being spewed out into that system. And we think that some of the ice and gas from these ocean worlds are actually contributing and feeding some of the rings around the planets in our solar system. So, Michelle, there's also an example of rings that were yeah. spotted, but in a, a rather unusual context Correct me if I'm mispronouncing the name, but is it Shariklo? Is that is that the name? Yeah, of, yeah close mm -hmm. enough. Good. Uh, so, can you explain to us what we are what we're seeing here? So, um, Shariklo or Shariklo, it's uh, um, it's one of these little icy worlds that orbits uh, um, between the giant planets. So, of the uh, um, population out beyond Neptune, there's a whole bunch of them that have different uh, um, different histories. They've encountered Neptune at different times in their history mm -hmm. and ended up on different different orbits as a result. So, this one. This is a little transient one. It's bouncing around between the giant planets and it'll do so for a fraction of the lifetime of our solar system, maybe a few tens of millions of years. So it's a, it's a brief interloper for us. And, and but was it, it surprising? To yeah, but this is, uh, um, we hadn't seen many rings on uh, yeah. worlds like this. So Haumea, a bigger dwarf planet, uh, um, had been seen to have a ring. But Shariklo, it turns out there's this beautiful set of two rings going around this. And so, yeah, this JWST image here, it's going very close to a star in that image, not quite in front of it. So the world itself, which is, you know, not much bigger than our, the city we're in, um, that doesn't go in front of it, but the rings do. Hmm. So you get this little drop out of light just for a brief moment on the starlight coming behind. And as you can the rings measure block from it. the spectrum, presumably, what actually is in there. Uh, that was a different instrument that could make that measurement. But yeah, you can see that they're, they're ice, they're crystalline right. water ice. 
And, and so, is this an asteroid? I mean, I mean what, how do you classify this object? I think of objects as being kind of on a... It's all due to that formation, right? Yeah. So what these are made of, this is a snapshot of their formation history. How things are today is a... They're all the product of their past, of, right. where, the, of where they formed at what distance from the sun. So, you know, if we say something's an asteroid, we often refer to that as being something that's a lot more rocky rich. So you look at the surface and you might see um, the kind of minerals that you're used to seeing if you walk into the outback. But if you say something something's more comet-like or like these little worlds like Chiriclo or um, trans other trans-Neptunian objects, they're more icy rich. It's that more kind of glaciers and frozen wastelands. And exactly what those frozen wastes are made of can be very different to what we see here on Earth. Now, there was a time when asteroids and comets were really viewed as, as two distinct entities. Like so many things in the world, it's not a binary, it's actually a continuum, and yeah. then you have N members. Yeah. Right, so it's, it's basically equity and inclusion on a cosmic scale. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so explain to us what we're seeing here, which gives a sense of mm. that continuum. Yeah, so this is giving an idea of uh, what we know of the, what I'd call the dynamical populations around the solar system. So this is uh, um, the small worlds uh, um, as we know them, where they orbit around the sun. Some of the, uh, many of these are ones we've found. We still have millions more yet to find. Millions. So, yeah. Oh yeah, we have a big new observatory called Rubin that's going to provide more targets for JWST in the future I to see. go look at. But yeah, these are telling you that you've got the rocky composition ones uh, near the sun where it's hotter. Just and then because the heat has, sub, you know, the liquid has evaporated yep, off effectively, the, right? Yeah, the ices sublimate. They, yeah. can't, they can't stick around where it's too hot. Right. Um, and so, so Stephanie, you, um, you've had some observation time on the James Webb Telescope, I believe, relatively recently, right? So what, what were you looking at? I was looking at this fantastic comet that was in the sky. Um, it reached its closest distance to its sun in January. Um, it's a comet called E3 um, from, that was discovered by the Zwicky Transit Facility. Um, it was discovered just over a year ago, and it's been dubbed the Green Comet. Um, it was a fantastic uh, bright comet that we could actually see. If you were in a, a nice dark area, you could see it just a little bit fainter than the Orion Nebula. So that gives you some perspective of how bright this comet was. Um, it's green in color. A lot of comets are actually green because of um, carbon emission. So whenever the ices are sublimating from the comet when it goes around the sun, um, a lot of carbon bearing molecules are coming off of it and that gives us this fantastic green color. Um, so I had a program on the James Webb Space Telescope to actually wait, sit and wait until we had a fantastic comet that we actually wanted to look at. And when this one was discovered, we had predictions that it was going to do something pretty fantastic. And so we, we sat on our hands and had all of the telescopes that we could possibly get access to um, looking at this comet to let us know that it was actually going to be something fantastic. We pulled the trigger in December, and um, we ended up observing it a, a few weeks ago, and we just got our data down, and I can tell you it's absolutely amazing. And can you share any insights on what you found? Um, yes. <laughs> Um, it, it's, it's a beautiful comet. Um, the spectra from James Webb Space Telescope is, is nothing less than, than what you would expect. It is absolutely fantastic. Um, we had a number of telescopes that also from the ground that were observing the comet at the exact same time. So we've been able to sort of cross-reference all of our data from all telescopes all over the world to, to verify our findings that we have with the James Webb Space Telescope. The one thing that we can do, though, from this observatory that we can't do from the ground is access a lot of the molecules that are in our own Earth's atmosphere. Mm. So if we're wanting to see something like carbon dioxide, for example, we cannot actually observe that from the ground. So we actually have to get above Earth's atmosphere in order to, to observe these kinds of molecules and look for those fingerprints that Michelle was telling us about. And uh, we have a fantastic detection of carbon dioxide in this comet, um, as well as some other very fun new findings um, that I'm not going to spill the beans on just yet. And, and, and so, you know, comets, asteroids, part of the interest, I mean, they're interesting in their own right, but part of the interest is we still are 
not completely sure of how Earth got its water. And one of the possibilities could be that it was brought to Earth by, say, comets. W where do we stand on that? Will James Webb give us any insight into that key question? We're already starting to get a lot of interesting results from the James Webb Space Telescope on water in small bodies in general, um, looking for things like crystalline ice in the outer solar system of these, you know, trans-Neptunian objects or Kuiper Belt objects, or even these these things that are sort of in the continuum, as as Michelle was beautifully explaining. Um, there isn't seemingly a distinction anymore between asteroids and comets. There's this diffuse sort of region where we are finding more and more small bodies and, you know, future surveys are definitely going to help us find even more. Um, but we're seeing that a lot of the volatile material is actually a lot closer into the solar system than we originally thought. Um, the chances of a near-Earth asteroid hitting Earth are a lot higher than something like a comet or um, a trans-Neptunian object, for example. Um, so understanding what the distribution of water across the solar system is something we're really striving um, for in small body science in general. And um, the James Webb Space Telescope is the machine that is going to tell us how much water there is in the inner solar system versus the outer solar system. Now, Michelle, you, you know, Stephanie, Stephanie, I'm, I'm sorry, just she made note of the fact that the possibility of getting slammed by an asteroid is perhaps, you know, even higher than one might have thought. You've actually been involved in that issue with the, the DART mission, which James Webb also was relevant to. Can you just give a sense of that? Yeah, so, um, so Stephanie was referring to the, uh, um, the probability of what the composition is of uh, um, something that could potentially be a danger to Earth. But yeah, so the DART mission, um, which myself and many colleagues around the sure. world, we had uh, folks involved on every single continent, was amazing. Um, what, what that mission was trying to do is demonstrate the technology of if you have an asteroid, and at the moment we know of no asteroids that pose any hazard to Earth, but if we were to find one that did, what would we do about it? Yeah. And so it was demonstrating, let's take the moon of an asteroid, not the asteroid itself, it's moon, and take a little spacecraft to about as big as what we're standing on here on stage, um, this kind of mat area, and let's, boom, a little nudge to that moon and then see how much we can move it. And so by watching that process happen and seeing with the telescopes in space and all around the world um, how much that asteroid moved, we can see the properties of that asteroid because we didn't know. There was a lot we don't know about asteroids and one of them is they're kind of like a rubble pile, you know, like you see in a construction yard, but flying in formation in space. Gravity is working very differently. So if you nudge that, how does it behave? Is it actually just like a, a school of fish and you, you, know, you put a dolphin near it and it goes foomph, yeah. <laughs> right? It, it's very different kind of physics. So and we had to try find? to find out. What did you find with that mission? We found that you can move an asteroid. So yeah, we can do this. We have this technology now. And hopefully with future generations of missions, we'll be able to build towards actually putting in place a capability that if these future other survey telescopes find something that is a hazard, we can do something about it. I mean, but would you say at the moment you feel more secure based on what you guys accomplished and the understanding that it's not just this big solid body of rock, but something that's more flexible? Is that a good thing for us? Yeah, it was actually really good because it turned out uh, um, when the spacecraft hit the moon, the asteroid moon, um, material came off towards the spacecraft as well. And uh, um, yeah, this is, uh, I love this one. So this is, the, uh, um, this is the artist impression that we have. I think we, oh, yep, this is good. This is also some of the dart imagery that we have from the spacecraft. That's the artist impression there of what it would look like from something sitting off. And uh, um, JWST actually imaged this. I think we have this one. Do we have the infrared one? So you say JWST actually was able to turn around and look at this. Yeah, it was, was watching, that a big deal it was watching in real time. So yeah. it was uh, um, Christina Thomas and the um, team organized uh, that. So yeah, this is from a little camera that was watching, that was a, a little selfie cam that the DART spacecraft re released that was made by the um, Italian collaborators. And that watched as DART actually hit the moon and JWST was watching um, from 
uh, from back in its Lagrange point as this impact happened. And you see this beautiful spray of ejector come off of the yeah. loose material coming back. And that was really important because the amount of momentum transferred as these things hit, that's what tells us about how easy it's going to be to move one of these in the future. And so we're not going to need decades and decades of lead time to try and be able to move something. We can do it with less than a decade of lead time for ones of this kind of size class. Yeah, no, that, that, that's, so, a, that's a huge relief. Yeah. yeah that's great to hear. Uh, it's so, nice when problems are easier be, right? than you think they're going to be. So, Stephanie, you mentioned um, Jupiter before. Mm. You've also been doing some work on Jupiter, understanding, for instance, the red spot and its development and so forth. Can you take us through a little bit of that? Yeah, so um, the Jupiter system is um, a fantastic program that was accepted um, even before all of the, the science programs for the first year of the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, it's a very large team of planetary experts all over the world that are working on the whole Jupiter system. And what's amazing about what we can do with the James Webb Space Telescope is, is it's highly complementary to everything that we've been doing with other facilities, both on the ground and in space. Um, the long-term program that we can have now with the James Webb Space Telescope, understanding how much longer of a mission that we have um, due to our fantastic launch, um, gives us a, a timeline that we can now extend the, the legacy that the Hubble Space Telescope started by looking at the Hubble, uh, by looking at Jupiter, and then following that and seeing how things evolve over the next 20 years. Um, one of the things that we know about Jupiter is the Great Red Spot is actually shrinking. And we know this by looking at it almost every year with the Hubble Space Telescope and actually measuring the size of that storm. The James Webb Space Telescope will now follow in that legacy, not only monitoring that storm to see how it evolves in size, but also in composition. So I'm sorry for interrupting, but when, you, when, when people talk about a storm, can you, you know, is it okay to use our experience with storm on planet Earth? Is that what's going on? Is it, you know, what's it like to be in that storm? It's, it's like a massive hurricane. <laughs> it's a hurricane that's as big as the United States. We're actually studying where in the atmosphere that giant storm actually is with the James Webb Space Telescope. Because at longer wavelengths, we actually see different areas of the atmosphere. Mm. Um, so at, at wavelengths that we see with our own eyes, you're kind of seeing things that are um, sort of at the stratospheric level. And as we go to different wavelengths, longer and longer, we can actually see various, various components of how things are interacting across that atmosphere. So clouds in the upper atmosphere versus the those that are a bit further or deeper down. And we're also studying the composition of the storm, seeing how hot it is. Um, what is the chemistry that's being stirred up by this giant storm as it's going around this massive planet? And how is it interacting with the other um, atmospheric or other clouds or otherwise that are in the, in the general vicinity of it. Um, so we're really getting some really unique insight into what the composition is, how active the storm is as far as, you know, its depth into the planet, um, but also how it's interacting with, its other, with the other nearby environment. So there's a lot of fantastic science coming out of this program. Now you say that it's shrinking, and, and I guess Jovians are celebrating that the storm is starting to recede finally. But um, <laughs> do we have an understanding of why weather patterns here on Earth, you know, you have a storm, it lasts, you know, a couple days at, at most. Why is it so stable, even though it's shrinking? Why is it hanging around for, for years and years? Um, it's, it's likely due to just the atmospheric nature of this giant planet. Um, we don't have oceans and, um, uh, and terrestrial, you know, impact of that ocean and how it's interacting with the atmospheric environment on Jupiter. So the storms tend to be a little bit longer lived because they are, they are only this gaseous material that extends extremely deep into the planetary atmosphere, um, down to we don't even know how far or deep they actually go, or, and we don't have access to penetrate that deep into the atmosphere as well. So understanding how what the longevity is and what drives them is something that's still 
pretty big mystery for us as far as atmospheric science, even in our own solar system, um, let alone the Earth. Well, it's completely fascinating. Just a couple of questions before our second phase of this program draws to a close. Um, a question for both of you. Stephanie, you've also been doing work on, on the moons of Jupiter, I understand. I, I, I know that there is you know, reluctance to share things until they're fully accepted for publication and so forth, but can you give us a feel for where that work is going? Um, absolutely. So one of the programs that we have for the first year of science is studying these ocean worlds across the solar system. There are um, a number of objects that we believe either have um, these large bodies of briny like water that uh, reside beneath a, a crusty surface. And that crust is usually um, icy in, in material. Um, and we know that there's these oceans based on how, how the planet uh, dynamics um, from nearby spacecraft, how they orbit, how they interact with other bodies in the general vicinity. And so we've also seen evidence of gas actually spewing like a, like a geyser um, out of the surface of some of these ocean worlds. Um, one of them being a moon around Saturn um, called Enceladus. And then another one, um, there's been tentative detections of these plumes around and um, around the moon called Europa. So one of the key things we wanted to do with the James Webb Space Telescope with its fantastic sensitivity and wavelength coverage was really see if we could actually s detect the plumes and also determine what the composition of them are. And so um, we had a, a number of observations that have occurred already. Um, the work is is under peer review right now. Unfortunately, it's taking quite a while um, to get through that process, but we're working on it. Um, we have some amazing findings. Um, I will say that uh, a number of people have already accessed the data from Europa. Uh, there's a lot of interesting findings that were predicted that have been confirmed and verified now with the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, I'm not going to say too much more without spilling the beans on that. Um, but also for Enceladus, um, we confirmed the plumes of Enceladus that the Cassini mission actually detected, um, and we have some composition on what those plumes actually are. So this all feeds into you know, future missions to either of those ocean worlds. We're, we're actually launching a mission, um, the European Space Agency is actually launching a mission in a few weeks uh, to go to the Jupiter system. It's a, it's a mission called JUICE. Uh, so it's very exciting times, um, and the James Webb Space Telescope's only gonna feed more and more information into these bodies and these worlds um, as we move forward and the spacecraft approach those those systems. So Michelle, final final question. You know, we just heard from Stephanie making reference to measurements of the composition of the plumes and Celtus and so forth. Obviously, I think the question that is most prominent in most people's mind is, will there be any evidence of life? And do you think James Webb is set up to be able to, for instance, give insight into that question? And, and where do you think it's going to go? I think it's a, as with any new telescope, every discovery it's going to make is going to build on a heritage of discoveries that came before. And I love that this telescope is for the first time from, you know, an Earth proximate telescope to show us these plumes, right? Because we didn't know about them until we sent our little spacecraft, the product of our hands and minds and effort, all the way to Saturn mm. and saw them up close. And so that is something where now we do have that step in capability to start to characterize it. Will the molecules that they can, you know, pull out of these spectra, these, uh, um, these fingerprints of composition, is that going to be a signature of life? It's partly going to depend what we mean by what we think of as conclusive of life. Mm. We're going to keep seeing organic molecules. We keep going to see the, the building blocks of amino acids, of things that are um, sometimes known as precursor molecules for you know, DNA and things like that. We're going to see these molecules that are really necessary for life as we know it to take place. 
it's going to be really hard to go from that through to, is this the signature of, you know, a little jellyfish, a very small one that has then gone shook into space in a geyser, and then we've happened to see it, right? right? That's not where we're getting to with this necessarily. We're seeing the pathway that's going to lead us to be able to make these statements as we start pulling together this information. So it's a, it's a journey, right? If this was easy, we wouldn't be doing it. <laughs> and 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 do you are you among those who view the discovery of life beyond planet Earth to say be the pinnacle of discovery, the thing that will really change our sense of who we are, or do you think it's the kind of thing it'll make headlines and then a year later it'll be like, eh? They found a jellyfish in the bloom. <laughs> I mean, a jellyfish on Enceladus. How cool would that be? But I think it is going to like. In the same way, every discovery about the universe changes a little bit our conception of who we are as people, yeah. where we came from, how we relate to what our ancestors knew of the world and where we ourselves now live. Yeah, it's going to change who we are and how we think about ourselves, but it is going to do so in a way that we maybe haven't thought of yet. Yeah. And, you know, it's that we are at a point where we're seeing ourselves in the universe in a new way. We are definitely at a point in history where people are starting to view that quite differently. So I think we don't know what it's going to be like to live in a universe where we know there's life. I think the exciting thing is that we do live in a solar system that's full of these ocean worlds, these yeah. kind of worlds with ice shells around them and oceans under them, these right. environments that can be habitable. So yeah, I want to live in a solar system where we think there's things that can be like life on five or 10 or 15 worlds. Right, and seeing that life may have begun on planet Earth on the ocean floor, the oceans that we're finding is portending that possibility in, in, a, in a good way. Fascinating conversation. We need to move on to phase three, but please join me in thanking Michelle and Stephanie. Thank you so <laughs> much. All right, so our, our final section today will be jumping off on this discussion about planets, asteroids, comets in our vicinity, and talking about exoplanets. And this is a really remarkable chapter because, look, if you think about it historically, there was a time, of course, when we thought the Earth was the center of everything, and then the sun, and then we recognized the sun is just an ordinary star in the suburbs of an ordinary galaxy, of which there are hundreds of billions of stars. Then we learned about other galaxies, and each of them has hundreds of billions of stars. When we ask the question, though, are we special in that our sun has planets? That was a question that until recently we really did not know the answer to, but now we do. And as our guests now will describe to us, we recognize that having planets is an absolutely ubiquitous, ordinary feature of just about every star. So let's go into a discussion of exoplanets. Our first guest, Jesse Christensen, is NASA's Exoplanet Archive Task Scientist, where she searches for exoplanets and determines which celestial objects should be included in NASA's exoplanet database. Thank you so much for joining us, Jesse. And finally, we have Benjamin Pope, who's a lecturer at the University of Queensland, who focuses on developing and applying new data science approaches to detecting characterized exoplanets. He's among the handful of researchers here in Australia with guaranteed observation time this year on the James Webb Space Telescope. So welcome, Ben. Welcome to you both. So Jesse, let's just jump right in and just give people a, a sense here. So when was the first exoplanet discovered and where do we stand right now? How many have we found? That's right. So the first planet that we found around something that wasn't our sun was in 1992, so just over 30 years ago. And it was actually a really strange discovery. People had been thinking about exoplanets for a long time and trying to think of ways to find them and building instruments and doing surveys and working really hard. And then two radio astronomers over here were looking at this pulsar, which is like a very small, rapidly rotating neutron star. And they were like, what's happening here? And eventually they worked out there were planets going around this pulsar. So all of this hard work to like set up for decades to find planets, it's these two radio astronomers who were like, huh, that's strange. So 
the first two planets we found were actually around uh, a completely different kind of star, a dying star at the very end of its days. Um, and it wasn't until three years later in 1995 that we found the first planet around a normal star like the sun. Uh, and that was the, the discovery that won the Nobel Prize in 2019, the discovery of 51 Peg. And so since then, this has been an endeavor that has just turned up more and more, right? That's right. So if you actually look at the number of planets we know with time since 1992, it's rising exponentially. Every year we're finding more and more and more. And that's uh, really because one of the things Brian said is that we now know that planets are everywhere. Most stars in the sky have planets around them. Uh, but it's really the fact that our technology finally caught up with our ideas. We've been thinking about this for so long, looking at these stars and wondering if they have planets like our sun. But it took years for us to you know, build CCDs and build spectrographs and get telescopes in space so that we could finally actually find them. So last year, we hit a major milestone of 5,000 confirmed planets outside our solar system. Now we're at 5,312 as of today. 5,312. That's right. So, so Ben, Jesse made reference to most stars having planets. I made that statement as well. Is that on firm observational foundation? More or less. So, uh, you know, um, when I was a kid, actually, the textbooks I By had By the way, school, you still yeah. look like a kid to me, but that's a, <laughs> oh, a different oh. issue. I'm 32, I'm 32. <laughs> you know, when I was a kid, the textbooks I had at school hadn't been updated yet for the discovery of 51 Pegasi. And I was saying, it's not clear if there are planets outside of our solar system. And, you know, people used to have theories that said this was rare, that this was the yeah. interaction of, like, two stars passing by one another having some kind of collision, right? And so, the really the big thing that changed this was Kepler. So um, for the first sort of decade of exoplanet studies being, you know, a scientific discipline with discoveries, um, most of these planets that were being found were uh, often sort of things like hot Jupiters, we call them, which are, you know, massive Jupiter, but much, much closer to the sun than any of the giant planets in our solar system, or indeed any of the planets in our solar yeah. system. They'd be interior to the orbit of Mercury, you know, really, really hot environments, things. You know, people didn't really have theories for why these should exist. They were sort of pathological. Um, though people pretty quickly figured it out that they actually form far out and migrate in. So I, th I think that's actually still in dispute. <laughs> well, you know, there, there's, there's people who say they form in situ, yeah. Yes, there's still viable in situ yeah, theories. I, I don't think, yeah, anyway. <laughs> we, we, could, we could get into that, you know, anyway. Um, but, uh, yeah, so Kepler was this big revolution where it was able to do a sort of um, a survey that wasn't biased just towards finding these, these short period high mass things. It was a little bit, but it was actually able to dig down to much lower mass things and go to long, you know, longish periods of a few years, um, find a lot of terrestrial planets, yeah. and it found that planets are pretty ubiquitous. So, um, you know, Jesse said there are 5,000, you know, known um, exoplanets. I think she, she actually was being quite modest. Jesse discovered the 5,000th known exoplanet last year. <laughs> Is that true? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hey. It, it was actually the one that ticked it over the, uh, over the line. <laughs> but, um, you know, uh, there are many more planets that we consider to have been um, validated statistically than, you know, rock solid confirmed. Yeah. And Jesse's actually the one who sort of often makes that call. You know, as, as head of the archive. They have um, to pass my bar. <laughs> yeah. But I just do wonder about one thing. Yeah. Were you holding on to that planet mm. discovery until it was 4,997, <laughs> 99, then you announce? I, I'll, I'll actually tell you, it was a paper that had 60 planets in it. And I was actually trying to avoid it being one of the papers that crossed over 5,000 because NASA was super excited about this milestone. They were going to do all this press. And I was going to like, I was like, it's going to look like nepotism if I have my own planets be the ones that go over. And yet. I, so I really did try to have it not work out that way. But just the order in which papers were right. accepted and press mm. came out. It, it had to, we actually put a bunch out together. So I think we put out 70 or 80 at the same time. So collectively, we crossed the 5,000 mm. mark together. Excellent. And, and so of those, I mean, what fraction seem to be, well, Earth-like is one measure, but habitable, I guess, is the more general. Is I'm that showing it? zeros. I'm, zeros. <laughs> you said Earth-like yeah. and then you said habitable and I yeah. showed two zeros. <laughs> and, and, and so do, what does that suggest to you? First of all, wh what is the definition of habitable for, for this type of exercise? Sure. So for Kepler, uh, which Ben talked about, it was a NASA mission that ran for four years. Uh, we defined habitable as having a temperature of the planet between 180 and 303 degrees Kelvin. Right. So Earth is 273 degrees Kelvin. So Earth is kind of like in the middle, sort of towards the high end of that temperature range. I live in Southern California. It sometimes feels like we're at the very high end mm. of that habitable range. Um, 
But there's so many more factors that go into habitability. You know, all of these planets that we're finding, we actually know very little about them. We, we, can guess, we can get their size, we can often measure their mass. With JWST, we're able to start looking at their atmospheres, which is super exciting, but often we know very little. Um, so we use temperature as a very broad brushstroke to say this is a habitable zone planet. It's in the right range for what we say for liquid water to be on the surface. Um, that's the habitable zone where liquid water can be on the surface. But there's so many other things yeah. we don't know about what you need for life. So for instance, on Earth, the fact that we have tectonic activity, the fact that we have volcanoes and the continents are moving on top of a, of a liquid mantle, that might be really important for habitability in terms of the molecules that get put in the atmosphere and then captured in the rock getting circulated. Uh, we don't know how important tectonic activity is for life. So when we say habitable and we're talking Talking about exoplanets, often we're really just talking about that very basic number, which is its temperature. Right. But there's so much more we don't know. So let's jump into to the Webb telescope, Ben. What's the most exciting new insight it's provided into exoplanets? I think um, so far, all the, the exoplanet discoveries with James Webb have sort of been um, confirmation of its capabilities. We're, we're seeing these amazing quality data of, you know, um, so the, the main way that James Webb's able to measure the composition of exoplanet atmospheres is by the transmission spectroscopy method, right? Can you explain that just yeah. a bit? Yeah. And so you've got, um, you know, uh, Kepler discovered all these planets by looking for a dip in brightness as they cross in front of the star. Uh, probably You're just saying yeah. a, a planet goes yeah. in front and just, just blocks out a little light. passes between us and the star, just like the transit of Venus uh, a few years ago, or the transit of Mercury. You know, maybe some of the people saw it here. That was actually, you know, an important thing in Australian history is James Cook was actually not exploring the South Pacific to, you know, encounter and do a lot of things in Australia, but to actually observe the transit of Venus from Tahiti for, for astronomy purposes, mm. you know. Um, and so this is a classic way of detecting exoplanets, but it also allows us to find something out about them. Because if you look for differences in, in how much light gets blocked by the planet as a function of its colour, that tells you the colour of essentially all the dawns and sunsets of the planet all at once, just in the same way that when you look at a lunar eclipse, you see the moon is lit up red, by the light filtered through the Earth's atmosphere. Again, we get light filtered through this planet's atmosphere. And with sensitive enough measurements, you can measure the composition of the atmosphere from those details. Now, the issue is sensitive enough measurements. Um, Hubble Space Telescope uh, has done a bunch of transmission spectroscopy of atmospheres with claims of a lot of discoveries. Many of these claims are pretty, pretty solid. Many of them are controversial. Um, the, the quality of the Hubble data is sort of just at the edge of mm. where you're able to make conclusive statements about exoplanet atmospheres. James Webb just nails it. It's, you know, it's getting a really amazing quality data. Um, so far, it's mainly been looking at things where we had a fairly solid understanding of what we expected to see. What's going to happen over the next couple of years is it's going to start to look at things where we don't know what we expect to see. You know, for stars like TRAPPIST-1, which I'm super excited to see, which is actually one of the closest maybe systems of maybe habitable planets. I don't think they're habitable. Other people, other people disagree. What do you think, Jesse? Um, <laughs> you know. Yeah, well, so there's, yeah. A, there's a really interesting phenomena We're talking about how common planets are. Mm. So rocky planets like the Earth seem to be very common around really small, cool red stars called M dwarfs. So mm. our sun is just a boring yellow middle-aged G star, uh, but most of the stars in the galaxy, 75% of the 100 billion mm. stars mm. in our galaxy are M dwarfs, small, cool red stars. And they seem like they're really good at making rocky planets in their habitable zones. Their habitable zones are much closer to their stars than, than our habitable zone is. So it takes us 365 days to go around our sun to be in our habitable zone. Around an M dwarf, it's more like two weeks. So you're very, very close to the star. But that's a problem for M dwarfs because they put out so much more of their energy as high energy radiation, like X-rays mm. and UV. And that's bad for life. We live in Queensland. Yeah. You know, <laughs> SPF and sunscreen was invented because UV is bad for life. Mm. So these planets, they might just be sterilized by their stars and yeah. might have no atmospheres. Um, so one of the things that Ben's talking about is the fact that we don't know whether these rocky planets around M dwarfs have atmospheres. They might not, in which case they're not habitable by the sort of life that we know, yeah. which is a whole other question. Completely. Yeah. Sure. Um, but that's actually one of the things I'm most excited about for JWST. JWST finally has the sensitivity to look at these tiny planets yeah. around these really dim stars and look to see if they have atmospheres. 
so far, yeah. <laughs> so far we're not seeing much yet, which backs up Ben's point, but I'm optimistic because there's lots more to look at. Um, and yeah, I'm really excited to see if these planets have atmospheres. If they're habitable, the habitable real estate in the galaxy goes up yeah. by orders of magnitude. Yeah. Now you have confirmed the existence of photochemical reactions through these kinds of observations as well, right? So You're I mean, do you want to just give us a sense of that? Sure. Um, so. Uh, when we're looking at atmospheres, uh, often with the sensitivity that we've had so far, we're just finding the, the molecules that make up most of the atmosphere. So like here on Earth, we have nitrogen as most of the atmosphere, and then we have some oxygen and then other trace smaller amounts. So when we look at these atmospheres, mostly we're finding what is the thing that makes up the bulk of this atmosphere? Is it carbon dioxide? Is it methane? Is it carbon monoxide? Um, so one of the very first spectra we got from JWST was of one of these hot Jupiters, so a gas giant heated up to thousands of degrees because it's right next to the star. And there was this mystery absorber. We had such high precision that we could see the big bumps we'd seen before with Hubble, but there were new little wiggles. And one of them was a wiggle we'd never seen before at a wavelength we'd never seen a wiggle at before. So these first papers came out and they were like, cool, <laughs> new thing absorbing at 3.9 microns. We don't know what it is yet. Uh, so they went off and did a bunch of work and it turns out it's silicon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, sulfur dioxide. Um, and uh, sulfur dioxide is a photochemical that uh, you know, gets created in the upper atmospheres of these planets as the starlight interacts with the molecules at the top of the atmosphere. So for instance, ozone in our atmosphere, it's a photochemical reaction happens at the top of the atmosphere. Again, we have less ozone in Queensland than other places. Um, <laughs> but so this is evidence that we're seeing photochemical reactions. We're able to see elements and molecules that actually take up a quite small fraction of the planet's atmosphere because of the precision from JWST. And so at least we're seeing evidence for the basic ingredients of life. We're seeing evidence for the basic processes that at least we know were important to life on planet Earth. As yet we don't know, as you're saying, if other details will somehow make things so special here that life is rare throughout the universe, but it's, it's a challenge, it, it, but it, you know, one feels like it's going in the direction. Oh, for sure. We're making progress. You know, these are, these are measurements and questions we never had the ability to answer or ask before. Uh, and it's just, you know, how much further down the road can we get with JWST? And, and so Ben, you, you have observing time yeah. coming up. So what are you going to focus upon? Not just coming up. Um, it's actually just happened over the last week. Oh, is that right? Yeah, it's really exciting. So, um, if people can see this, this is the prototype for an instrument that's actually physically on board James Webb. It's the only Australian hardware on James Webb. It's the aperture masking instrument. It's actually designed by Peter Tuthill, who, if you're coming to the Exoplanets um, panel later, is one of the speakers. Uh, he's my old boss. Can I just say one yeah. thing straight out? I'm sure it's deep and yeah. important. It doesn't look so impressive. No. So could you maybe it's give us some? No, it's remarkable. You know, this is it's 19th century technology. It's not the size of the aperture mask. Yeah, you're right. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> so this is just a tiny piece of metal that blocks out everything but a, a certain pat pattern of holes that are sort of mathematically chosen ah. to maximise the quality of the image of the telescope at really high resolutions, right? And so why would we need to do this? Um, the issue is that exoplanets are very, very faint. Stellar systems at great distances uh, seem very, very small. You know, it's small because it's far away on the sky. And uh, so you need to get really, really high resolution images. And in particular, you know, the James Webb, um, you know, mirror segments, it's got this segmented mirror. They actually have these things called tilt events where they actually thermally jump as, as the temperature changes. You know, they actually get dinged by micrometeorites. This is actually something that happened very early in the mission. And so there's all these things that you want to be able to correct for. So you want to structure the image mathematically in a way that makes it really easy to do. And so because we, we put hardware on the telescope, we get rewarded in guaranteed time observations. Ah, great. So Peter tells me that this cost about $300 to have made in an expensive alloy to go on the telescope. But every hour of James Webb time is worth about 100 grand of US taxpayer money. And we got rewarded with uh, nearly a day of James Webb time for contributing actual hardware. So, you know, it's a pretty good investment, I think. Well done. You know, and so um, we actually had... Uh, on screen, on one of the slides I saw up up there, um, PDS-70 is this system. Uh, yeah, no, I think that one. Yeah, beautiful. So, um, P, you know, the, like planets just get names, which are catalogue names. This is the Protoplanetary Disk Survey Object 70. You know, I, I apologise for yeah. the names. They're all rubbish. <laughs> it's, it's very prosaic. <laughs> 
But, you know, it's, it's actually, this is one of the most exciting objects in the entire sky. This is a disk from which planets are actively being born. So, you know, our solar system was formed out of a disk of gas and dust. I think Michelle was talking about this earlier. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Michelle and her colleagues and geologists on Earth can figure all sorts of things out about that disk, from, you know, measuring the carbon, you know, sort of the uranium dates of rocks and, you know, other isotopic compositions and stuff like that. But what would actually be really awesome is to see this process happening in real time. And so that's what we're looking at here. This is actually the only system, I believe this is true, unless someone's published something very recently, the only system in which we have images not merely of a protoplanetary disk, we've imaged a lot of those, but of a planet in that disk, pulling material from the disk, which is that dot in that image. That dot is a, is a planet just like Jupiter. The dot's the, the yeah. bright spot the, on the, the right there. The bright spot sort of yeah. interior to the, to the sort of yeah. oval, which is, which is sort of gas and dust. Why is there a black circle in the middle? Yeah, well, so this was taken with a coronagraph, uh, which is designed to block out starlight. And so the black circle is, is sort of dotted over where the coronagraph goes, right? That dot, the bright one, is not merely a planet about the mass of Jupiter, but it's got a disk around of it, like Jupiter used to, hmm. like a scaled down version of star system formation, in which we believe moons, like Jupiter's Galilean moons, are being formed right now. Wow. And so this is the kind of quality image we have from the ground. And unfortunately, I cannot show you the image we got last week uh, from James Webb, but I can assure you it's much better. And so um, we're super, super excited. This is, um, you know, the beginning of a long journey. This is, for example, you know, James Webb is great hardware, but it's also partly a software mission course, because, you know, yeah. we launched it and yeah, cool. It's, you know, it works really beautifully. It actually works, you know, really, really well. It's actually gathering more light than we expected. And so some of the images are overexposed. This is a problem for us because we're trying to get really, really great detail. And so we actually observed three sources. This is the only one where the images just came out straight away really good because it's the faintest. The other two, we're going to have to do a lot of digital processing. But to, the data really is there. It. It's just oh, harder yeah, the data to is there and it'll be fine. Okay. But that's yeah. sort of my job now is yeah. I design algorithms for analyzing space telescope data. Beautiful. And so we're going to get one that looks like that, but a hundred times better. And I promise you, Two that also look like that, but a hundred times better, but they're going to re require a lot more work. And so ultimately, if you had a sequence of those, mm. I mean, you, you, you really want to film, but the yeah. time scales are such that looking at one yeah. image is going to be tricky. So if you find mm. at different points of their evolutionary development at different locations, then you'll piece together yep. the actual film by which exactly. a planet is actually formed. And we, we actually hope to get a film of this one so we can see it orbit. And then we can actually, you know, measure and, and, masses And you of will components. be able to get that level yeah, of... Yeah, if we do it a couple of times over a few years, we'll yeah, be able to Yeah, if JWST gets that 20 years they were talking yeah. about earlier, yeah. you'll be able to see motion of the planet. Wow. Yeah. So let me ask you, can we book you for the 20-year 20, <laughs> 20 anniversary? Um, <laughs> for sure. So, um, so, you know, somewhat more of a fanciful question. We see, you know, these wonderful developments in really understanding and seeing planet formation and how, how ubiquitous it is throughout the universe. If we do encounter life, and let's say we encounter intelligent life, is there an opportunity, do you think, that we will ever have real communication with them? Will it just be an interesting, abstract, intellectual understanding, going back to the thing that we discussed earlier, or will this really be integrated into some sort of cosmic conversation? Sure, I mean, we can extrapolate from times on Earth where civilizations interacted with each other for the first time at like different levels of technological advancement. Often it's not gone well. Um, uh, Australia yeah. is one example. Um, and uh, so, you know, we do these forward thinking experiments where we think about what what would we be able to see? So for instance, if it was simple, single-celled life, it would change its atmosphere, the atmosphere would look biological and you'd be like, great. Um, this period of time that we're in, that humanity's in right now, we've only had radio communications for decades to like 100 years. Um, so if you think about the size of our galaxy, which is 100,000 light years across, and think of how far our radio emissions have gotten in 100 years, mm. which is 100 light years, because that's how fast radio travels, we've, we've communicated with this tiny bubble of the huge galaxy. Um, so one of the things we try to think about is not how would we communicate with ourselves right now. You know, one of the obvious things is to look for radio waves coming from other places because we are communicating with radio right now. But that's 
that's just going to be a blip in human history that we that, that this is the way we communicate. Um, you know, people are already starting to look for lasers from other stars and that kind of thing. Um, there's going to we're going to evolve and we're going to move forward. So the question is, for instance, if it was a sufficiently advanced technology, would we even recognize mm. it? Right? Like if we're looking for radio waves and they're a hundred million years past radio as their predominant way of communicating, would we even know what to look for? Um, so it's really hard to know. So people try all these different things. You know, as soon as we get a new instrument like JWST, we're like, what would we be able to see if there was life? We can look for biosignatures. We can look for techno signatures, which is signatures of intelligent civilizations. Um, but it's a lot of guessing. It's a lot of trying to think in the future. Like, what what would we do in the future? Like, you know, how the devices that we would use to track more and more of the sun's energy, they would be visible in a certain wavelength of light from a certain distance. Like a Dyson sphere or exactly, something. Like exactly, exactly. So, you know, we start to, when we, whenever we do an infrared survey of the sky, people are looking for Dyson spheres that would put out waste heat from civilizations, capturing all the energy from their suns. So it is fanciful, as you say, but, you know, we have to start somewhere. So we're just extrapolating from what we know now and trying to think, what could we see and how could we see it? And, and so, then we go looking. You know, when you, when you think about the timescales that you mentioned, time scale for formation of life on the order of billions of years, civilizations again on the order of billions of years once life formed. So the odds would be that if we encountered an alien civilization, there'd be a billion year difference between our state of development. You know, they could be behind, you know, or we could be behind. And so, so do you ever sort of imagine that, you know, the advanced alien civilization is now looking at the James Webb telescope and saying, you know what, they're doing okay over there. <laughs> you know, not yet, you know, they're not, but they're on a good, I mean, at least like, you know, you talk about the radio waves, you know, they're like seeing Trump <laughs> and the Webb telescope. And they're like, you know, at least there's some people right. on that planet, yeah. Yeah, yeah. you know, that are maybe worth I mean, our time. The news about Trump getting elected only just got past our nearest stars. Thank God. Right? Yeah. Like, they, they don't know yet. Yeah, that's right, right. Which is too bad we can't hold that back. Right. So, so you, know, um, you know, in 20 years, where do you think we'll be with this science? Maybe just uh, take us out, both of you, with a thought on that question. Maybe Ben? About life in the universe? Or, or what yeah. we will learn about the study of exoplanets and will we get to the point of being able to say something truly about life? I think we will. I mean, I think um, the way I like to see James Webb at the moment is, um, you know, say, say the early 20th century, people wrote science fiction novels about the forests of Venus and the, you know, the, the dinosaurs that lived there, about the civilizations of Mars on their dying world with canals. And then in the, say, the 50s, 60s, 70s, we started to visit these places and started to find out that they weren't like that at all, that Venus is so hot it rains lead. And, you know, on Mars, there's no, you know, water or air really enough for a civilization and no trace of life in either place. Um, what we're at now is the cusp of that revolution, but for exoplanets. Yeah. Where, you know, um, until maybe circa 2010, we had no idea, observationally, about what exoplanet atmospheres and compositions might be like. We just knew that they existed. And then over the last decade, people have quite painstakingly put together material from Hubble and from other observatories to get some idea of a few exoplanets, you know, at low signal to noise, at great effort. James Webb is going to start to do this systematically and with high precision for a lot of exoplanets. And so I'd like to think that in maybe 10, 20 years after Webb's had a few more years to do this science, we're going to have quite a sophisticated understanding of how planets are born, how they evolve, and what sorts of planets are there out there. Now, Webb's not going to have the sensitivity to detect life per se, but it might detect, you know, what compositions of atmospheres are there, what are the processes that shape these over, over sort of astronomical, cosmological, geological time. And the next observatories that we have will actually be able to say, this particular planet does it have life? You know, there's this habitable worlds observatory that NASA is, you know, starting and, and in the early And when's that supposed to launch? How 20, long is a piece 20 of string? 20 to 30 you know, years from 20 now. 20 to 30 years from now. Yeah. Convenient. Yeah. And yes. I think we're taking a look at it right here. <laughs> yeah. Oh, this is, yes, this is one of the concepts that went into this idea of a habitable worlds observatory. So after JWST, there's the Nancy Grace yeah. Roman Space Telescope. Yep. And then after that, the big thing that we're trying to build right now is a telescope that would actually be able to find Earth-like planets around stars like the Sun. Uh, JWST won't get there. It's a magnificent telescope, but it's not going to get to planets like Earth around stars like the Sun. But Habitable Worlds Observatory will do it. 
we just have to that when you book me back in 20 years so you'll talk about the this of habitable worlds all yeah. right this you're is, on yeah <laughs> this is sort of a generational thing right it's like hubble was launched four months before i was born right and then we have waited until then look i'm 32 you mm -hmm. know we've waited until really now for anything that exceeded the capabilities of Hubble, yeah. it will be as long again before we get anything that exceeds the capabilities of James Webb. Right. It's like building cathedrals. It's, it's, it's a huge generational task. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and an amazing one. And the yeah. fact that this incredibly yeah. complex, sophisticated instrument is doing not only what it was specced out to do, but doing even better is really testament yeah. to the, the power of human ingenuity, technology, right. and it's imagination. so rewarding for the thousands of people who worked on it to see the data come down. They're exquisite. Absolutely. So thanks for spending time with thank us. You. Please join me in thanking our guests. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Really wonderful. Thanks. See thank you. Later. you. Okay. Thank you.